Well, welcome. Um, I have the honor to introduce uh, Robert Costanza. So um, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Robert Costanza today uh, as the director of the Gun Institute for Ecological Economics and Gun Professor of Ecological Economics at the UVM. Uh, I had a couple of thoughts on this introduction. Bob has made an incredible contribution to the field of ecological economics. Uh, some have referred to him as the godfather of ecological economics or, <laughs> or stepfather, something like that. Um, authored, I guess, 300 some papers um, on ecological economics and related issues. Um, and his work has inspired not just my students, but people around the world as, as we're now facing one of our greatest challenges, which is global warming. Uh, I just don't know how uh, Bob can write so many papers. I don't know if you have to sleep. Very well. Okay. <laughs> but uh, on another note, Bob's innovative research and writings on ecological ec economics is, uh, besides being very scholarly, uh, it's grounded in what I would say is values and passion that's very similar to the values and passion here at Antioch. Um, where economics, where people, all people and all ecological systems matter. Um, and that all people and ecological systems are not a footnote at the bottom of the economics, but it's core to the economic system. And uh, that's why I think uh, he might be a kindred soul with our values here. So, Bob, well, thank you for very coming very much. Thanks. It's a pleasure to pleasure to be here. Can you hear me in the back? Is that okay? A little, a little louder. A little louder. Okay. <laughs> I'll try. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm very interested to, to learn more about uh, about Antioch and, and its values. And I brought a, a couple of my grad students uh, along with me. That that uh, if you guys could raise your hand so you know who they who they are. This is Michelle Masazura and Ida Kubashevsky. Um, and so we'll have some uh, some interesting discussions. I hope in the uh, in the afternoon. Um, I want to just start by, by pointing out that um, to really solve problems in a practical way, I think involves the integration of these three elements of having an adequate vision, both of how the world works, our scientific paradigms, um, and also of how we would like the world to be, our goals uh, and vision, vision for the future. Um, and uh, I think we need to, to recognize that even science itself is dependent on uh, on this pre-analytic vision. Uh, what is it that we're really trying to do? Um, so I'll talk a bit about that and also about the, the tools and analytical techniques that, um, that need to be appropriate to that vision. We need to, to evolve new tools and, and analysis uh, to be appropriate with this new, new vision of the world. I think the whole idea of sustainability is, is part and parcel with this changing, evolving vision of how we would like the world to be. Um, but also, I think our vision of how the world works is, is changing quite dramatically. Uh, our, our evolving ideas about complex systems and how they, um, how they function. And particularly about how humans function as a part of the rest of nature. Um, so getting beyond the compartmentalization of, of the disciplines uh, and disciplinary understanding, I think is part of this evolving paradigm. Um, and finally, our implementation strategies have to be more consistent with this evolving vision. How do we particularly build more adaptive kinds of institutions? So, I can see that too well, but um, part of the issue with the changing vision is that we no longer live in an empty world, empty of humans and their artifacts. Um, the world is, is uh, filled up with, with human activities. And this is, uh, you can see it, the nighttime satellite imagery that you've probably seen on a, on a uh, flat display uh, many different times, just to make the point that <coughs> the anthroposphere is now a major component uh, of, the, of this global system. Uh, and some people have even said we live in a new geologic era called the Anthropocene, uh, just because of the magnitude of the, of the changes that, that humans have brought uh, on the planet, largely a result of the, uh, the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, this is a plot uh, from Colin Campbell's uh, recent work um, <clears throat> on this idea of peak oil. Just to calibrate the audience. So here, who here has ever heard the term peak oil? All right, so this is a different place. <laughs> 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 I told you to share a lot. 
usually if I ask that question, there's like two or three hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, not the calibrator. <laughs> So you know all about this. You also know about, <laughs> you also know about the, uh, the idea of net energy uh, as opposed to gross energy. So it's, it's even worse than it, than it looks because the energy required to get this energy out of the ground, get it to the, the point of consumption, uh, is obviously an important feature. And <clears throat> some sources of, uh, or at least apparent sources of energy, like ethanol from corn, uh, may not actually be sources of energy at all. If it takes more energy directly and indirectly, to get to, to grow the corn, to, uh, to, to uh, create the fertilizer, to build the tractors, and all of the other stuff that goes into actually producing that energy. So this concept of net energy or energy return on investment is a, is a really critical one. And even <clears throat> when we're talking about oil and gas reserves, as we, uh, as we explore further out uh, in the oceans and, and get uh, harder to find resources, the net energy from these, these sources are really going to decrease. So <clears throat> some people think we're already at the peak. Um, some people think the peak in oil, global oil production is, uh, is a little bit into the future. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, somewhere in the not, not too distant future, oil and gas um, production will, will peak. Um, <clears throat> this is the distribution of the remaining reserves of, of oil and gas stocks. The black circles are the remaining reserves. The red circles are the original or estimated ultimate recoverable uh, oil and gas. So <clears throat> it's kind of an interesting pattern you see in this, in this, uh, in this map. Uh, <clears throat> all the Middle Eastern countries have big black circles in the former Soviet Union compared to, to everywhere else in the uh, uh, so I think that explains a bit of what's going on. <laughs> I don't know. Some people would deny it, but hey, I think there's something going on. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, we're beginning to, to really better understand the way this complex ecological life support system functions. This is a, a, uh, a model from NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's a global climate model, one of several that, that are, are, uh, are out there. And this plot is showing um, in white relative humidity and in orange precipitation. You can see it doesn't show up quite as well on your, on your screen as it does on my screen. But, um, <coughs> It's, it really shows in one place the complexity of this atmospheric system that we're, uh, that we're dealing with and many of the major features of that system. The intertropical convergence zone you can see here, the fronts moving across the northern and the southern hemisphere, um, <clears throat> and several of the other features of this, this climate system. And um, these models allow us then to look at the sensitivity of the system to various human-induced changes like um, increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, changing land use patterns, uh, all of these other things that, they're, that we're currently doing <coughs> uh, to change to change the system. Um, and okay, how many of you have seen this diagram? <laughs> Pretty good, but not, not quite as good as the peak oil thing. So you're more in the peak oil than climate change. <laughs> um, <coughs> this is from the IPCC report, actually the previous one, um, and and reiterated in the current one. This is a reconstruction of the Earth's temperature uh, in the northern hemisphere over the last thousand years from ice cores, sediment cores, other sorts of uh, records. Uh, this is the historical uh, measured uh, temperature in the northern hemisphere. So you can see there's you know, a <clears throat> uh, measurable rise in the average temperature in the northern hemisphere. And then these are the projections of the various climate models, like the ones I was just showing you, under various scenarios and, and different models with different assumptions built into them. Uh, <clears throat> but in general, we see that um, this burning of fossil fuels is has caused and will continue to cause further changes in this, this global atmospheric system, which are projected to have a range of different impacts, <clears throat> uh, depending on what uh, degree of temperature change. And this is from the, uh, the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change. Who's, heard, who's ever seen that report? Okay, now we're getting down to the, <laughs> the harder core stuff. Uh, very interesting report. I can I can recommend it. <clears throat> um, they took the IPC. These are basically the IPCC uh, projections, and you can see that there's there's certainly a lot of uncertainty into into exactly at what temperature change some of these things will occur and the, the magnitude of those changes. But this gives you a good picture of the kinds of things that we can expect uh, impacts on food, water, ecosystems, uh, extreme weather events. Uh, food, Increasing intensity of storms, hurricanes, floods, etc., uh, as as the temperature uh, increases. 
and particularly the risk of abrupt and major irreversible changes, things like the, uh, the ice sheets melting, um, that would have uh, positive feedbacks and would, would, uh, would really change things uh, much more dramatically. Uh, the Stern Review concluded, and this was done from a very conventional neoclassical economics point of view, uh, that um, addressing, these change, uh, addressing climate change and keeping the temperature rise below the two degree centigrade uh, threshold was something that would cost about 1% of global GDP. But not addressing these, these issues and allowing these impacts to occur would cost about somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of 5 to 20% of global GDP. So even from a purely narrow perspective, <clears throat> their conclusion was uh, it's, a, it's a good investment on our part uh, as a society uh, to address these issues and to avoid some of the potential damages including things like um, increasing severity and frequency of hurricanes. This is Hurricane Katrina approaching uh, the coast of Louisiana, uh, increasing flood frequency. Um, <clears throat> this is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Who's heard of that? Okay, good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and it brings up to me, I guess, this question because the, 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 uh, the rebuttal here is always, well, we can't really afford to do this because it will hurt the economy. So what exactly are they talking about? What is this economy that we're going to hurt? And what exactly is the, the economy for? <clears throat> um, now from an empty world perspective, this is what the economy looks like. Uh, it's you know land, labor, and capital. You can see that land is kind of grayed out here because there's an assumption of perfect substitutability between these factors of production, which then go together and produce goods and services <clears throat> measured um, as GNP. Um, and these are all marketed goods and services. So these are only the goods and services that are exchanged for money in markets. Those are either consumed or reinvested to build more capital so we can have more GNP in the future. Uh, <clears throat> individual utility or welfare is a function largely of the consumption, the absolute level of consumption of these goods and services. Uh, you can see there's nothing in this model of the world that would in any way limit the, the increase in production of GNP into the indefinite future. The idea is we want it exponentially increasing GNP forever uh, into the indefinite future. <coughs> okay. Uh, is there something wrong with that picture? Yeah. <laughs> um, property rights are also um, conceived in a fairly simplistic way of either private property or public property. And the idea is if we're talking about marketed goods and services, it's better to have uh, private ownership of those marketed goods and services. And that will lead to their more efficient production and consumption. So the idea is to squeeze out the public sector, increase the private sector to the extent, to the extent possible. Um, <clears throat> of course, some people take this even to extremes, and this is just one example from a, a uh, <clears throat> ad that I found on Airplane in Flight Magazine, it's from Alabama Power. Their motto is, always on. So remember that <laughs> nighttime satellite image, well, they would like Alabama to look more like this. <laughs> And probably Florida Power and Light would like to do the same thing over here in Florida. <coughs> you know, um, so I think that model is really quite embedded in, in uh, a, lot of, a lot of minds out there. But <coughs> it's not consistent with our vision, our emerging vision, of how we understand the world to work uh, from many different angles. Uh, first of all, the biophysical world. We know that we live in a materially closed Earth system. So you're not going to have material production of the economy increase exponentially forever. And exponentially is really fast if you work through the math. I remember Julian Simon once said that um, we could have exponential growth in population for seven billion years and with no problem. And it turns out that in a couple of thousand years at exponential growth rates of just 2%, the mass of human bodies would exceed the mass of the Earth. And a couple of thousand years after that, it would, it would exceed the mass of the entire known universe. Uh, so. <laughs> Seven billion years of exponential growth. I, mean, I don't think he quite got the idea of exponential growth. There. And we know from you know studying uh, any kind of biological system or ecological system that you're not going to have exponential growth indefinitely. What you have is growth for a period, and then you have um, a leveling off of growth and further development uh, of the organism, or in this case, the, the economy. Uh, but it doesn't involve <coughs> further material growth. <clears throat> so there's that. There's the fact that there's not unlimited substitutability between these factors of production. Uh, 
lines. So I've drawn solid lines in there and <clears throat> sort of changed the names and added, added at least one additional one. Instead of talking about land, we're talking about natural capital, the uh, capital indicating that it's a, a stock of resources that provides a flow of, of uh, services or amenities. Some of those services are uh, necessary for the conventional economic production process. Some of them never go through the market or the conventional process at all, but directly affect uh, human well-being. And we call those ecosystem services, those, those services that affect human well-being uh, either directly or indirectly. Um, there's also, in addition, instead of calling it labor, we're calling it human capital, just to emphasize the fact that it's not just people's physical labor, but the, it's largely the information stored in people's brains, their education, uh, their health, uh, all of those other aspects of, of individuals that are, that are really important to their well-being, as well as to the conventional production process. Um, the manufactured capital is pretty straightforward, but then there's social capital. This is all of the networks and interactions uh, among people, uh, our, our institutions, our, our informal networks, all of those uh, ways that people interact with each other that are absolutely essential both for the conventional economic process and also for, um, for human well-being in, in a more direct way. Um, so <clears throat> this idea of human well-being and what, con what contributes to that is also a, a major difference uh, between the conventional model, that it's not uh, merely a, a um, uh, function of the um, absolute level of consumption of goods and services. In fact, in that regard, it's more the relative level of consumption that, that uh, people find to be contribute to their sense of, of well-being. But it's also all of these other non-consumption related factors uh, coming from natural and social capital uh, resources. And there's been a lot of psychological research out there recently. There's actually something evolving called the science of happiness what actually does lead to people's sense of well-being. A lot of survey research that I'll touch on uh, a little bit later. So we need to understand, <clears throat> um, you know, when we say, what is the economy? Uh, the economy, I would argue, is this whole thing. Um, and it's, uh, <clears throat> it involves uh, natural capital, uh, the natural world. So the environment is not separate from the economy. The environment is part and, and a major uh, component of what leads to uh, human well-being. And what's the economy for? Well, I don't think it's just for uh, consumption of goods and services. That's a means to an end. Uh, but the end is really sustainable human well-being. Uh, so we have to understand, <clears throat> we really want to be economists, we have to understand what is, what is that goal uh, and what contributes to human well-being and how do we, how do we modify or arrange our system uh, to optimize or maximize the contribution the, the sustainable well-being of humans uh, you know, into, the, into the indefinite future. <clears throat> okay, so that's what ecological economics is uh, all about. Um, you probably know that both ecology and economics come from the same group, group oikos, which means um, house. So ecology is the study of the house, economics is the management of the house. We want to do those in a more integrated way. That <clears throat> There are three integrated questions or goals. We first want to have a ecologically sustainable scale or size or magnitude of this economic subsystem. So you can think of the economy as a subsystem of this larger ecological, socio-ecological system. Uh, but you can also think of uh, natural capital as a major component of what we could call the economy. The scale of that economic subsystem has to be ecologically sustainable. The distribution of resources, both within the current generation, but also between the current generation and future generations, and also between humans and other species, has to be fair. And the <coughs> allocation of resources um, should be efficient. We don't want to waste resources, but if we're going to do that, our allocation mechanism has to take into account all of the resources that affect our goal, which is <coughs> quality of life, human well-being, uh, more, broadly, more broadly conceived. And many of those resources are outside the current market allocation system. Uh, so our current system is not really economically efficient. Too many external externalities. It's certainly not socially fair. And it's probably not econo ecologically sustainable. <clears throat> How do we start to address these questions or goals? We need to first start to have a more substantial transdisciplinary dialogue. Uh, so this is not, these are not questions that are going to be answered from the point of view of any one existing discipline. Uh, it's going to take uh, an ability to understand the whole system <clears throat> of humans embedded in, in, uh, in the natural world. Um, 
we need to focus more on the problems facing society rather than the methodological tools that the conventional disciplines tend to get, tend to get hung up on. Uh, we need to have a more integrated approach to science, one that balances analysis, which is taking the problem apart into its pieces, with synthesis, putting it back together and trying to understand the way the whole, whole system works. Uh, and we need to <clears throat> have more effective and particularly more adaptive institutions, institutions that can learn from uh, their behavior uh, and that can, that can uh, <clears throat> uh, achieve these goals. So here are some key questions, I think, um, for, for ecological economics. Uh, what exactly are humanity's shared goals? Do we have any shared goals at all? Or you know, is it that everybody has their own individual goals? I think we do have shared goals, and, it, and when we've done workshops with very uh, diverse groups of people and ask them that question, how would you like the world to look at some point in the future? Uh, there's actually quite a bit of overlap in terms of the, the kinds of goals that they, that they express. Uh, part, mainly they focus around this idea of quality of life. Uh, how, do we, how do we, first of all, define that, and then how do we achieve it and sustain it? What actually contributes to, to the quality of life of, of people? Um, <clears throat> how do these four types of capital that I mentioned contribute to uh, quality of life? Um, how do cultures evolve? Uh, the, the changes that we're talking about in human behavior are, uh, can happen much faster than in other species because our behavior can be learned from our, our parents in the, in the previous generation. We can pass on learned behavior through cultures, <clears throat> and cultures evolve in, in ways analogous to the way um, organisms evolve. Uh, but with some interesting differences. Uh, how does that work? We have to understand that process if we hope to, to change <coughs> the direction of that, of that evolution. Um, what actually drives human behavior? What makes people happy? What makes them behave the way that they do? And how do we manage human affairs to achieve these shared goals? So that's just a list of some of the key questions. This issue of quality of life, I think, is a central one then. So if our goal really is sustainable quality of life, sustainable well-being uh, for people, what, what does that mean? Uh, <clears throat> we had a workshop a couple of summers ago with um, people from the, the full range of disciplines on the UVM campus, from medicine and nursing and engineering and computer science. And, you know, um <clears throat> and it's interesting that all of those disciplines had some connection with this aspect, this idea of quality of life, but they were all sort of doing their own things and looking at it from slightly different points of view. So we tried to synthesize all of that, and this is a, a diagram, there's also a paper <coughs> that you, could, you can read that goes into the details on this. But uh, our idea came down to this, that quality of life was the intersection of these three elements. <coughs> there's this idea of subjective well-being. You can go and survey people and ask them, you know, how happy are you? Um, and there's been a lot of that kind of work being done recently. Um, <coughs> happiness, utility, welfare, there's different terminology that's sometimes used, but it's basically that sort of thing. How, how well do people feel um, internally? Um, <coughs> that uh, is dependent on uh, this basic set of human needs that comes originally from the ideas from uh, Maslow, but more recently from Manfred Max Neef and, and Martha Nussbaum and, and even Amartya Sen that there's a, <coughs> a set of basic human needs that are cross-cultural, <coughs> uh, but those are weighted in different ways. Uh, so the, the extent to which uh, those, their, the need fulfillment <coughs> actually affects subjective well-being depends partly on uh, cultural norms, uh, the social capital uh, institutions, and other things that we've, that we've talked about. Um, and then um, what we can do with policy is to affect the environment, the built human, social, and natural capital, and the amount of time that people have, and their ability to, to meet those needs and then fill this sense of subjective well-being. So they're sort of subjective and objective elements um, combined in this, um, in this definition. And so <clears throat> the key then is developing this better understanding of the opportunities to create a sustainable future with a high quality of life. Sustainable human well-being is the goal these four types of capital as the, the major contributors uh, to that goal and developing that, that better understanding. A major part of that, I think, is a, a more realistic vision of human behavior. <clears throat> um, more realistic, certainly, than the conventional economic view of, of human behavior, which uh, these elements are sort of in contrast to. The conventional view is that you know, people basically have one, one goal. Um, 
And in fact, we know that people have multiple motivations, different personality types, and different cultures. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, individual motivations are, are certainly quite diverse. Uh, the conventional assumption is that people have you know, unlimited knowledge and they're perfectly rational, which you can show me one of those people. Actually, there have been experiments. <laughs> just one. Just one. <laughs> Somebody raise your hand. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there have actually been experiments uh, that show that, actually, that the, uh, the only people that, that behave even approximately like the conventional model uh, of economic behavior are economists. <laughs> <laughs> And usually it takes a PhD to get to that, that level. <laughs> um, actually, yes, if you have some time, you should go on YouTube and look for the video called uh, Stand Up Economist, uh, where he kind of goes through quickly and, and explains or translates the 10 basic principles of economics for the, for the uninitiated. <laughs> um, anyway, <clears throat> this idea that satisfaction is based on relative rather than absolute consumption. And you know, this, this seems to be a pretty robust uh, conclusion from, from tons of survey research and all these non-consumption factors. This idea that there's a central role for the emotions in decision making and evading uh, social traps. So the conventional idea is that people are rational uh, decision makers. That's all they need is you know, figure out the costs and the benefits and, and, uh, and then make your decision. Uh, <clears throat> that turns out not to be the case, and I'll show a little example in a second. And that <clears throat> uh, we're not isolated individual little atoms, we're all embedded in this multi-scale complex adaptive system. So the fact that people are connected together with each other and they're connected with other parts of the system, and that's kind of different than the conventional assumptions. On this idea of the emotions and, and uh, decision making, <clears throat> there is an interesting example back in the 1800s of this guy Phineas Gage, he was a Railroad, railroad worker here in Vermont had this freak accident with a tamping rod that went through and took out part of his frontal lobe. Uh, <clears throat> and he survived this accident <clears throat> and he seemed to be perfectly fine. He could, you know, he could think, he could calculate, he could do all his mathematics. He was perfectly rational. But his personality had changed and he sort of lost his emotional response. And uh, the net effect of that was that he could not make a decision. He could not you know, decide what to have for breakfast or what sort of clothes to wear, and he was just totally incapable of making any kind of decision. So <clears throat> there is this interesting relationship going on. There's been a lot of work recently on, on this connection between you know, our emotional side and our <clears throat> intuitive side and our rational side. And we really need some of both to make, um, to make decisions. Um, <clears throat> this idea that more consumption leads to, uh, to more uh, well-being uh, I think is, is also being challenged. This is data on GDP per capita versus um, survey data from the, uh, the uh, of life satisfaction, or subjective well-being. And you can see, and this occurs um, from a number of different studies, that there's, uh, there's a saturation effect beyond a certain threshold. Uh, there certainly is a connection uh, up to a certain point. Uh, but once you pass that threshold, then additional consumption-related activity doesn't really improve well-being all that much. I mean, just as happy you know, living in Portugal, as in the United States, and Portugal is you know, an average of $10,000 a year uh, GDP per capita versus 26 or 28,000 in the USA. So, <clears throat> um, there are, you know, we could think of the world as divided uh, into, you know, the overdeveloped countries out here, the obese economies, <coughs> and the <clears throat> underdeveloped uh, countries over here. And our goal really should be more to, at least in terms of GDP, uh, to bring things more towards uh, convergence uh, in, in the middle. Uh, and GDP, as Kenneth Boulding said, GDP is really gross national cost. It's not gross national welfare. It has very little to do with, with welfare, Oops, as I'll point out a little bit more in a second. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've done some additional work trying to explain this life, these life satisfaction scores in terms of uh, proxies for human built social and natural capital. And this is from a recent study where we uh, <clears throat> um, built this relationship based on the UN's Human Development Index. This includes GDP per capita, spending on health, and education. So it's kind of the built-in human capital components. And then a natural capital index based on the value of ecosystem services. And that explains a chunk of the, the data, but it doesn't explain some of these outliers. And largely, I think it's because we didn't have a good social capital index. Um, <clears throat> the sum index of 
the, dis, the strength of people's friends and families and social relationships, et cetera, at the, at the international scale. So, so, so we're still working on this, and uh, there's, there's new data coming out on, on uh, both the life satisfaction <coughs> scores and better estimates or proxies for social capital we're hoping to use for that kind of study. Um, <coughs> but at the national scale, we put a lot of emphasis on GNP, GDP, um, <coughs> and those like kinds of measures. And there's, you know, the, the newspapers are full of, of uh, stories now about the, you know, the looming recession, meaning GNP is, is, uh, is sort of not going up. Uh, <coughs> well, GNP really was never intended as a measure of economic welfare. It's a, it's a measure of economic income or activity uh, and or cost, if you will. Uh, <coughs> And um, it's only those transactions that are picked up in the market as well. So it's only things that are, that are transacted for dollars. And you can get some very weird results because, you know, if, if there's extra activity, um, it's, it may or may not be a positive. If there's an oil spill, somebody cleans it up, that means more, um, more economic activity, but not necessarily more, more welfare. Uh, more <clears throat> air pollution leading to more health care costs, that can add to GMP. But it's not necessarily a good thing. So there have been several attempts uh, to look more at economic welfare as opposed to income by subtracting off those negative things and adding in other things that are positive. Um, this index of economic, index of sustainable economic welfare, um, and there's also uh, a version of that called the Genuine Progress Indicator that I'll show some, uh, some results from in a second. Um, but this still assumes that um, consumption is related to welfare. Uh, so that it's just taking the net versus the gross consumption. We could also take it a step further and say, to what extent are these human needs that we talk about actually being met? And in fact, an efficient economy from this perspective would be one that you know, meets the maximum human needs with the least amount of consumption, the least amount of GDP. That would be real efficiency. Uh, <clears throat> so there's that range of things. But if you think of this GPI, Genuine Progress Indicator, or ICW, they're pretty much the same thing. Uh, this is what goes into it. You've got uh, personal <coughs> consumption expenditures, which is a major component of GNP, uh, but then that's weighted by income distribution. <coughs> and the reason you need to do that, if you're talking about welfare instead of income, a dollar's worth of income to a rich person doesn't produce as much additional welfare as a dollar's worth of income to a poor person. Uh, so you need this adjustment for income distribution. It also affects social capital, I think, quite quite directly. You get too big of a, of a gap in incomes that tends to destroy uh, some of the cohesion in the, in this, in the society and, and, uh, and depletes your social capital stock. Um, it also then adds a few things that are left out of GNP but should be in there, like the value of household labor, the value of volunteer work, uh, and then it subtracts a whole bunch of things that are in, would be counted as positives in GNP, GNP but are obviously negative. The cost of crime, family breakdown, um, loss of leisure time, you know, the cost of commuting. Who wants to have more commuting time? Who wants to have <laughs> <laughs> I would spend more time sitting in my car, you know, <laughs> um, you know, who wants more water pollution? Who wants more air pollution? So all of those losses of natural capital are also subtracted from the ICW or GPI. And you get results that look sort of like this for, for several of the countries that are for which it's been done. Uh, <clears throat> for the U.S., for example, I'll just, uh, I'll just skip over to the U.S. one. Uh, <clears throat> GDP has continued you know, on up from 1950 until the present, where GDP, GPI, <clears throat> peaked in around 1975 or so and has been fairly flat uh, ever since then. So you know, our, our GDP has doubled since 1975, but our, our real welfare really hasn't, hasn't improved much, uh, much at all. The reason being that all of these external costs, things that are not picked up in the market transactions, um, <clears throat> are beginning to outweigh the, the, the gains in, in uh, conventional economic production. So <clears throat> what is our goal for the economy? Uh, what goal should we be pursuing? Obviously, we're pursuing this goal right now of maximizing GDP, <coughs> but that's not really uh, improving our, our overall welfare. We need to, to shift that vision in order to make real progress. This is also consistent <coughs> with uh, survey data on people's level of life satisfaction we talked about. That's also been pretty flat since the, uh, since the 70s up until the, up until the present. So <coughs> what are some of the things that we need 
uh, to do and think about. Um, natural capital and social capital uh, fit into this category that uh, Peter Barnes has called and others have called uh, the commons. And uh, what we really need to do, I think, is to focus more on the, the commons sector of the economy. You know, think, about it, think about it that way. The commons are all the things that we, all the gifts that we inherit or create together. So they're all gifts and they're all, they're all shared. Uh, they're, not, they're not things that, <clears throat> that, uh, that we as individuals uh, create. Uh, but they're gifts from the environment, from our, our interaction with each other, uh, <clears throat> you know, the natural capital resources and the social capital resources that, uh, that I talked about, including things like the market itself <clears throat> as a form of social capital, and the internet, and many other sorts of, of social capital. Um, it's been estimated that these common assets <clears throat> uh, represent a much larger chunk of the real economy, this broader economy that we're, we're talking about. Uh, extending beyond the market economy than, than private or, or state-owned assets. <clears throat> um, and they're broken down here into the natural and social uh, capital uh, components of this, uh, this larger economy. Um, <clears throat> and a big chunk of those is from natural capital, yielding ecosystem services, which are the benefits that human derive, humans derive from functioning ecosystems. So who, who here has heard the term ecosystem services? All right, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're actually evaluating your educational program. Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking I'm exploring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, this is again from the Millennium Assessment, and they uh, <clears throat> sort of um, grouped these services into these four categories of supporting, provisioning, regulating, and, and cultural services, all of which affect various constituents of, of human well-being, as we've been talking about. Um, and our ability to, to understand <clears throat> this, these range of ecosystem services, I think, is, is fairly recent. You know, and and uh, so it's not surprising that we didn't focus on them too much in the past. Uh, but this is a uh, satellite um, compilation uh, of net primary production in both the, the uh, terrestrial and marine parts of the system. Just to give you a feel for how the whole, this whole global system is functioning. I mean, we couldn't really put these kinds of pictures together even, even 10 years ago. Uh, so our ability to understand <coughs> uh, ecological systems and the connection between those systems and, and human welfare uh, is something somewhat recent, and, uh, uh, but, but very, a very important uh, research area and development. Again, here's Hurricane Katrina. I'm just going to run, run through one example of how one might evaluate the contribution of these natural ecosystems to, to human well-being. This is the storm surge from Hurricane Katrina. You can see that uh, when it hit New Orleans, the storm surge was about 18 to 20 feet in height. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons that that storm surge was so high was because of this loss of coastal wetlands. This is the, the Mississippi Delta Plain, <coughs> uh, uh, which was all built up from sediments carried down the Mississippi River over thousands of years. That was in 1839, this is in 1870, this is in 1993, this is 2020, or actually close to the present. So there's been a huge loss of those, those coastal wetlands. There's another way of looking at it, uh, that have built up from 6,000 years ago until more or less the present, <clears throat> they were building up at about three square kilometers a year from all the sediments coming down. And, and the marshes trapping the sediments and, and uh, keeping, <clears throat> building up that deltaic plain. Uh, enter the Corps of Engineers. <laughs> and putting levees along the sides of the Mississippi River, diverting a lot of that sediment-laden water out off the edge of the continental shelf. Uh, also enter the uh, oil and gas industry, um, dredging canals through the Mississippi Delta Plain and, and uh, uh, causing saltwater intrusion, other effects that lead to, uh, to losses of, of wetlands. Also enter um, farming practices and damming the Mississippi River upstream, which led to less sediments overall getting down, down the river in the first place. So a combination of factors that led to 65 square miles a year of losses of, um, of those coastal wetlands <coughs> in the recent past. Okay, then what happens when a hurricane comes? This is a plot of all the global storm tracks from 1980 to 2006. Um, <clears throat> we were originally going to do this study globally, but we could only get good uh, wetland area data for the U.S. coasts. And so for the U.S. coast, we managed to get maps of showing, showing the wetland area, 
um, the <coughs> infrastructure, a, a an index of the infrastructure to be to be damaged, and this was from that nighttime satellite imagery that I showed you before, and that correlates really well with, with economic activity. And so we could plot that at a one square kilometer scale, <coughs> and then look at the tracks of each of the hurricanes, uh, and within that swath, you know, what was the area of wetlands, what was the um, GDP uh, to be damaged uh, or affected, um, <coughs> and uh, what was an index of the size of the storm in terms of the maximum maximum wind speed, and the total uh, dollars uh, worth of damages that the storm caused. So you can put that together in this little regression equation and try to predict the relative damages as a function of the wind speed in the wetland area. <coughs> Turns out that that fits reasonably well, looks like this, explains about 60% of the variation in the uh, relative damages uh, as a function of just those two variables. And the, um, <coughs> the, the coefficient for, for wetland area is negative, so the, the more the wetland area, the lower the damages are. Uh, and then you can convert that into an estimate of the avoided cost. So if you add an additional hectare of wetland, how much do you expect the damages from hurricanes to go down? So that's the, the value of these coastal wetlands for, uh, for storm protection, uh, <coughs> hurricane protection. That value, uh, the marginal value, uh, goes down as you increase the area of wetlands, but the total value goes up <coughs> because you increase the, uh, the <coughs> you're integrating under that marginal value curve. So Florida, Louisiana, Texas have uh, huge totals in terms of the, uh, the value of all of the, the wetlands. They have a lot of wetlands. They have um, a high probability of being hit by hurricanes. And um, they have a lot of infrastructure to be damaged. You can do that at the one square kilometer scale uh, and plot out a map that looks like this in terms of the value of each square kilometer uh, and, uh, coastal wetlands in terms of their storm protection value. It all adds up to about $23.2 billion a year in storm protection services. And that's just one of these 17 or 20 different ecosystem services that coastal wetlands and other ecosystems uh, provide. <coughs> you know, something on the order of $8,000 to $8,000 per hectare per year, with a, a big variation, because it depends on you know, uh, where the wetlands are relative to the infrastructure, and what the storm probabilities are, et cetera. So, <coughs> Several years ago, we, we tried to synthesize all of the information like this that was out there at the time, all the values of, of uh, various ecosystems, 17 different ecosystems and six, across 16 different biomes. Um, and <clears throat> these are the 16 biomes. If you add up the value of all of those 17 services uh, and put it on a per hectare basis and then multiply by the area, you get about $33 trillion a year, which is significantly larger than global GNP. So we're talking about the, the natural capital component of the economy. Uh, it's a larger, more valuable component than the, than the built capital component. Uh, and yet, this, uh, this type of capital, because it's outside the market, has been largely ignored by, um, by decision makers and policy makers. There were certainly a lot of problems with the way we did that study. This the paper, the largest section in the paper was actually the section on problems and limitations and caveats. But, uh, our conclusion was that solving these problems uh, would, would only lead to larger values. And some of the subsequent work we've done uh, I think bears that out. Uh, so it's really a very conservative uh, estimate of the value of those ecosystem services. Um, you can take those per hectare values and map them according to uh, <coughs> land use and get a map that looks like this in terms of the, where the natural wealth of the world uh, is being produced. I'm pointing up uh, <coughs> the state of New Jersey here in the Northeast because we recently did a study uh, to in a little more detail of the value of New Jersey's natural capital assets. You can get that report uh, from this, this website and begin to look at that in a little more uh, more detail. Uh, <coughs> Michelle Masazura over here is working on uh, Madagascar, or parts of the part of Madagascar, you know, in terms of uh, the same kind of analysis. Of, What's the value of the natural capital and ecosystem services resources uh, coming out of that? And we have other projects ongoing to, to do a more elaborate job, <coughs> as I'll <coughs> mention uh, towards, towards the end here. Um, you can also think about the changes in land use that we're making and what sort of effects that has on this, the value of these ecosystem services. I know you can't, can't read the letters down here, but <coughs> this again is from the Millennium Assessment. And uh, for example, 
changing from intact wetlands to, inse to uh, intensive farming actually leads to a net loss in value uh, because these social values <coughs> uh, of ecosystem services are lost uh, in, in the trade-off is that they're private values like in, from shrimp farming and other kinds of private marketable activities. But the social, there's a net social loss, um, roughly about 50% of the value. We did a study to try to figure out, well, what's the benefit cost ratio of conserving our global natural capital assets? Um, and the scenario we, we um, evaluated was, uh, what if we expand our current global reserve network to cover 15% of the terrestrial biosphere from current about 5 or 6% and 30% of the marine biosphere from currently about almost nothing? Uh, <clears throat> the cost of that scenario would be about $45 billion a year. The benefits then would be the net, the net value between the current um, ecosystem services value uh, versus the, the next likely use of those, uh, of those systems. And that ended up being about <clears throat> four to five uh, trillion, four thousand, five thousand billion, four to five trillion dollars a year. So the benefit cost ratio was about a hundred to one. Uh, a very good investment uh, in, our, in our current economy. The only better one I could find was uh, the, uh, the value of oil companies investing in political campaigns, <laughs> <laughs> which was about four hundred. It's been estimated to be about four hundred to one. <clears throat> but I don't think we should go with that one. Um, so that's the natural capital. What about the social capital? A little, a little bit harder to measure, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> but it's certainly been done, and there's a lot of work going on on social capital, and it's, it's, uh, it's understanding and measurement. This is from a, a, a book by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone, <clears throat> um, where he came up with an index of social capital based on uh, rates of participation in social institutions, bowling leagues, uh, you know, <clears throat> social clubs of various kinds, uh, religious organizations, and ranked U.S. states by their social capital index. And Vermont's doing real well. Vermont's doing real well, That's yeah. Nevada, not too good. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've been to Nevada and you've been to Vermont, you, see, you, know, you understand why that is. <laughs> um, but he also showed that that social capital index correlated very well with other kinds of indicators that you might think about. The higher that index, the lower the murder rate by state, the lower the TV watching by fourth and eighth graders by state, the higher the index of educational performance, and the higher the health, the health index of the, of the state. Uh, so social capital does contribute to quality of life and, in, various, uh, in various ways. <clears throat> um, beyond that, we're also uh, trying to build more integrated models uh, of humans embedded in ecological systems. Uh, so trying to, to integrate our understanding of the human and the natural part of the system. I'm not sure what our timing is on this, but <clears throat> just keep going until everybody's gone. <laughs> One way to handle it. <laughs> How can do a book on that election or Yeah, right. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, but I'll try to speed through the rest of this. I think I have only a few more things. Anyway, <clears throat> this idea of integrated modeling uh, as a consensus building tool, so we can use modeling not just as a way for experts to think about how the system works, but as a way to build shared understanding and to get people to think together about how these complex systems work and get that thinking into a form that can actually um, be a, a computer model. Uh, <clears throat> it has to be multiple scales. We can't understand these systems at one individual scale acknowledge uncertainty and limited predictability, the values that stakeholders bring. And there's multiple approaches to doing this. It's not, there's not one right way uh, to model these systems. But they all, I think, have to acknowledge that we live in a, a, uh, a system that's evolving, <coughs> that has a history, that has contingent events and limited optimization, and there's co-evolution of human culture and biology. Um, <coughs> I could, I could uh, direct you to this recent book on landscape simulation modeling that, uh, that we did, an edited volume, uh, that looks at various approaches to doing this, this kind of modeling on the landscape that involves stakeholders in terms of deciding what sorts of models and, and variables to include. Uh, but can get fairly, fairly complicated. We're able to deal with fairly complicated kinds of modeling environments uh, these days. And they can look at the spatial patterns as well as the dynamics of these, of these complex systems. 
I'll mention one project that we're involved in now <coughs> uh, to try to build a suite of models directed specifically at this idea of ecosystem services um, across a whole range of, of spatial and temporal scales and to uh, integrate our understanding of the value of these services with, with the modeling framework and be able to deliver that product on the web so anybody uh, could go and identify their, their area of interest or uh, the entire world and uh, be able to download <coughs> and run uh, one of these models that would give them some idea of what's, what's going on with their ecosystem services. Developed again in a, in a more collaborative uh, environment. Um, this is sort of the, this was funded by the, the Moore Foundation, <coughs> uh, structured something like this. So we include uh, this integrated picture, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, the atmosphere, and the anthroposphere, including social, human, and human capital. So we have all four of those types of capital uh, for each individual location, and that can, the model can then be run for a single location or for a whole array of locations in spatial grid or uh, in, in other forms, and the exchanges between those locations uh, can be modified. So it allows you to vary the, the spatial resolution and the, the temporal resolution that you're, you're running the model at. Uh, <clears throat> just to give you some idea of the kinds of results, if you run it at a, at a uh, one degree grid cell kind of um, arrangement, uh, for the whole world, this would be the, some of the input variables like land use and soil type, and at least one of the output variables like the water regulation service globally. You could do the same thing for the watershed scale. This is the Winooski watershed uh, <coughs> up in northern Vermont, <coughs> Wellington up here, uh, land use, soil drainage, and water regulation uh, kinds of services. Uh, so there's a lot of progress, I think, in that, that area, better understanding the um, the dynamics and spatial patterns, but I think we also need to look at the historical uh, patterns. If we really want to understand this issue of sustainability, uh, we have to look back and, s and look at societies and civilizations that, that, that have sustained themselves and then also that haven't, that have collapsed. Uh, so how do we build that, that more uh, broader understanding? Who's, who's read uh, Jared Diamond's book, Collapse? All right, I'm doing good. <laughs> There's another one you could read. This is, this is from a, a Dalham conference that we did, uh, trying to expand the, the uh, <coughs> universe of scholars uh, to, that we're bringing to this project and use this as a way of getting uh, historians and other uh, humanities types interacting with social and natural scientists to understand what we call the integrated history and future of people on Earth, or I hope is the acronym for the, for the project. Um, this is one graph. So, so when you do that, you have to s try to say, well, what, how do we get all of this kinds of different kinds of data together on the same page, even, um, before we can actually start <laughs> modeling them and understanding them? And this was, this was one attempt where we have, like, the um, technological changes over here, the various civilizations over here, and then some of the, bi the uh, environmental variables. The red one is the um, uh, temperature <coughs> uh, record going back. And this is a log scale of time, so it's 100,000 years, 10,000 years, 1,000, 100 years, and one. Interesting things that pop out immediately is that the temperature record at the beginning of the Holocene right here stabilized quite dramatically. So during this period, human um, Homo sapiens was around for 200,000, 250,000 years. During that whole period, <coughs> the temperature was quite erratic, went from ice age to one period, back and forth. Uh, <coughs> and then the start of the Holocene, this uh, stable climate, uh, <coughs> you could argue, was, was sort of a necessary development to allow the, the <coughs> development of some sedentary civilizations and agriculture and, and many of the other aspects of, of civilization that, we, that, we're, uh, that we're plotting here. The population, the uh, gross world product, also you know, water withdrawals, uh, <coughs> the conversion of, of, uh, of land from forest into cropland, uh, etc. How do all those things uh, interact? And how can we better understand this, this, these historical patterns of civilizations um, collapsing or, or being sustainable? The Roman Empire, for example, existed during what they call the Roman, Roman climate optimum. Uh, <clears throat> so there was a very stable uh, period of climate and precipitation in the Mediterranean during that, during that whole civilization. What led to the, to the collapse of that civilization? Well, <clears throat> it probably wasn't just the change in climate, but the change in climate at a time when the you know, the, the empire was very um, spread out and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> complex and, uh, and in, in what you might call a brittle state from a resilience point of view. It's lost some of its, its resilience and therefore these kinds of changes could, could uh, set off the collapse. Getting finally to the governance 
sides of these uh, of the issue. What kind of institutions do we need <coughs> to deal with these problems and to build a more sustainable society? <coughs> um, I think a whole a whole range of new institutions, uh, but here was a, an attempt to get some principles uh, on the table that we would need for uh, a sustainable governance uh, that, that could guide some of these institutions. We tried to get a, uh, a short list uh, of the, the main principles, and I'll just go through them quickly. The responsibility principle, responsive sustainable, responsive sustainable, responsive guides, responsive guides, responsive institutions, responsive, responsive, responsive. Responsiveness. 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 